the American people, the media might be very interested in this. Political junkies love it, but the American people want to be socially free, physically safe, financially secure. But they care a lot about a crime and if our president committed one. Is there evidence of one? Uh, well, Stephanie, I would say this tape is probably evidence of a crime minus one. And what does that I think mean? if Mike. Well, I, I, it means if Michael Cohen comes on board, he's going to provide the plus one information that the prosecutors will need to decipher what was being said here. You know, I can tell you, as a career prosecutor, we would never just introduce a tape into evidence and say, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, conclusive proof that a crime is committed. It is but one piece of the puzzle. It's a pretty important piece. It's a powerful piece of the puzzle because what we see, if we take a step back from debating who said cash, who said check, what it all means, um, and we, we kind of figure out what is the larger context. Well, the larger context here is that Michael Cohen is plainly a political fixer because this is very close in time to the election. They're talking about poll numbers and damaging information in uh, divorce agreements that are perhaps not yet publicly available. And then they're talking about setting up shell and sham corporations to make hush money payments to playboy models to further conceal damaging evidence to a presidential candidate. So if we kind of look at the context and not get so immersed in the words themselves, um, I, I think it's a really troubling picture that emerges, particularly when, as you mentioned, Stephanie, Hope Hicks is announcing on behalf of the president that he has no knowledge of this and no relationship with Karen McDougal. I, I think in the larger sense, this is extremely damaging. Okay, a fixer who's created a great big, a great big mess. I want to stay on that point. Uh, Bob, Hope Hicks in 2016 clearly said the president doesn't know this woman, knows nothing about it, and the president denied that. Here we are, fast forward. Well, that's clearly a lie. Clearly, the president was aware of Michael Cohen's activities. They have this discussion. There doesn't seem to be any sort of surprise on behalf of then-candidate Trump. But it's interesting, this morning, Mayor Giuliani was texting me, spoke to him last night. He continues to insist that the president was just being informed about Ms. McDougal at, during that conversation. Okay, he did. but when you're responding to him on text, I had dinner with Bob Costa last night. I'm not looking at my phone. I'm enjoying the appetizer, entree, and dessert. And this guy's working overtime, okay. talking to Lonnie Davis and Rudy Giuliani. What are you saying back to him when he's actually saying the president had no knowledge? You know, and Giuliani knows, that is a flat-out lie. He had an affair with her. So I asked Mayor Giuliani, could he put the president in contact with reporters? We need some clarity about what he knew at that time. How could he possibly he's, say? He's speculating in many respects. He says he's spoken to the president, but he's not providing the kind of factual clarity we need at this time. All right, Ken. Cohen's attorney, Lonnie Davis, we showed him there, compared this case to former vice presidential nominee John Edwards indictment that was back in 2011. Walk us through the significance there. I actually think, as Glenn was alluding to, this is more important than the debate about whether they paid cash or they paid check and what Trump was saying about that. John Edwards was charged with crimes because his wealthy benefactors were making payments to conceal an affair with his mistress while he was running for president. So he was charged with illegal campaign finance violations and conspiracy. What Lanny Davis is saying is that Michael Cohen is prepared to testify that there was a conspiracy to conceal these payments, these payments were made to help Donald Trump's election. If Michael Cohen goes into court and says that, you know, that's, that's, that's a crime. Now, the question is whether Robert Mueller or some other prosecutor is going to take that case against a sitting president who can't be indicted. Okay, I want to bring in the one and only Michael Avenatti. You know him, Stormy Daniels' attorney. He joins us on the phone. All right, Michael, you took to Twitter and you're talking about Cohen and his attorney, Lonnie Davis, saying, quote, Mr. Davis, Lanny Davis, Mr. Davis is a good lawyer, but his client, Mr. Cohen, is not innocent, nor is he a victim. He is a co-conspirator, dishonest thug, who continues to refuse to come clean and do the right thing. They are playing you and aiming for a pardon. Where is the rest of the evidence and tapes? Now, Davis says Cohen is not seeking a pardon, and you don't buy that. So, Michael, I, I got to walk, walk through a few things. A, give you credit, because you said there's not one tape, there's tapes. You were right. But a week ago, didn't you go out to dinner with Michael Cohen? They had said you ran into him in a restaurant. And I have to tell you, we got 14,000 restaurants in New York City, so I personally don't buy that you just ran into one another. And I think you said that you could actually see yourself working with Cohen at some point. So let's get through the noise and tell us what's really going on here. 
Well, Stephanie, um, I happened to just by happenstance run into Michael Cohen at Scalina Tella at 61st and 3rd. I decided at the last minute to go to that restaurant. I was with a friend of mine, and I walked into the restaurant. I was seated, and my friend said to me, you're not going to believe who's here. And I looked up, and Mike... I'm sorry? I'm sorry. Continue. So you ran into Michael Cohen. No, I, I ran into Michael Cohen by happenstance. And, you know, Stephanie, but that was not the first communication that I had had relating to us potentially sitting down with Michael Cohen and trying to resolve things, as I, as I said on CNN last night. This has been in the works for a number of weeks, but it was contingent on Michael Cohen coming 100 percent clean and disclosing uh, what he knew about the president and the president's uh, culpability as it relates to potential criminal conduct. And on Sunday, we had, a, we had a meeting actually set up on Monday, meaning two days ago, 4 p.m. in New York. And I canceled that meeting on Sunday because it became clear to me after speaking with Lanny Davis that morning that Michael was not prepared to do the right thing um, and wanted to basically have it both ways. And, and we're not going to participate in something like that. So my issue is as follows. Our issue is as follows. There's a number of other tapes. There's a lot of additional damaging information and Michael Cohen doesn't want to provide that information to the American public and doesn't want to come clean. He is playing, and Lanny Davis is playing the American public right now. And we're not going to participate in that, and we're going to continue to hammer away at this guy until he does the us? right thing. You think they're putting forth a front where they're saying, I'm trying to do the right thing, I'm releasing this tape to show that I'm a good guy, and that's not actually the truth? What do you mean they're playing us? No, no, that's exactly what they're that's exactly what they're doing, Stephanie, because, again, this is one of many tapes. Um, this is not even the tip of the iceberg. And look, if Lanny Davis is to be believed, his comments this morning that Michael Cohen is not seeking a pardon, Michael Cohen should issue a written statement this morning stating that he will not accept a pardon from Donald Trump, regardless of the circumstances. Okay, you Let's know see. he's not going to do that. No one would do that. Why not? Why not? Anyone who's facing prison time is not going to sign a document that says, I will not accept a pardon. There's no way he's going to. Would you do that? I wouldn't. Uh, S S Stephanie, I absolutely would do that if I went on national television or I had my attorney go on national television and say that he was not seeking a pardon. I don't get it. What, if, if that's the truth, he should have no problem issuing that statement. And if he refuses to issue that statement, that should tell you something. Namely, that he's trying to have it both ways, which is exactly what they're doing right now. There's nothing stopping Michael Cohen and Lanny Davis from releasing the balance of the tapes. There's over a dozen. There's nothing stopping them from coming clean and doing the right thing. There just isn't. Glenn, what's the rationale behind Lanny Davis, Michael Cohen, and even Giuliani being okay with even releasing this tape? How does it serve any of them? So he, here's why I think um, Mr. Giuliani opted to waive the privilege on this end, if reporting is accurate, some, some dozen other tapes. Um, if, if they continued to try to keep these tapes under wraps, what would happen? There would probably be litigation in court in New York about whether these tapes uh, would constitute uh, crime fraud, such that ultimately, if you had a judge announce at the end of that litigation that, you know what, yes, what we're hearing on these tapes constitute crime fraud. Therefore, they cannot be kept under wraps. The privilege will yield to the crime fraud exception. What do we ha and that and that litigation could be accomplished fairly quickly, literally within a matter of weeks. Then you would have a federal judge announcing to the world that Donald Trump committed fraud in these undercover recorded conversations and that would be, I think, politically and potentially even legally damaging to the president. So I think this is another instance of Mr. Giuliani trying to get in front of bad information, getting it out there, being able to spin it. And so we will all now spend our time talking about who said cash, who said check, and what does it mean when okay, I, I just don't think that's the import of these tapes. Well, somebody here, Michael, I turn to you. Why does that not matter? Today you're watching Rudy Giuliani split hairs between cash, check. Uh, he didn't add money order, but you can throw that in there. Why is that irrelevant? That, yeah, that's to me. Yeah, Stephanie, the, the reason why it's uh, irrelevant, because it goes to the bigger issue. It doesn't really matter whether it was cash or financing. And by the way, when Michael Cohen 
speaks of financing. I don't think he's speaking of financing as it relates to, you know, are they going to go out and get a loan or something like that? I think what he's speaking to is how are they going to make um, the payment? But the bigger issue in my mind is that this does not appear to be the first time that these two guys have sat down and engaged in conversations about how payments like this were going to be made. But more importantly than that, Stephanie, and this goes back to my first point, Michael Cohen could easily fill in the gaps on what we're talking about. He could provide the context. He could provide a two-paragraph or three-paragraph written statement. He doesn't even have to go on television and talk about the circumstances of what happened here. And this goes to my point. They're trying to have it both ways, and that doesn't work. All right, Mr. Costa, here's a name that stood out to me in here. In this tape, you hear them reference Alan Weisselberg, when he's talking about setting up the company. This guy is an integral part of all Trump finances. Not just Donald Trump, he worked for Fred Trump. He has, a, he, this guy is deep in the weeds. If this guy is now caught in the crosshairs of all of this, this thing could crack wide open, much wider than if you paid cash or check or if Hope Hicks lied. It could have consequences for the Trump organization, not just some transaction between Michael Cohen and candidate Trump. This was something that other people were aware of. And it's going to be, come back to Ken's point. If the federal government decides to make a case on uh, election law and misuse of election law and paying people off without reporting it, then other players involved could be called to testify or could be in legal hot water. But what is the punishment for something like this? Because in the tape, Michael Cohen talks about setting up a company to transfer it to our friend David. He's talking about David Pecker, who runs American Media, who owns a National Enquirer, who paid Miss McDougal 150 grand. So let's say there's campaign finance um, violations. What is the actual punishment? Because if we're sitting here saying, oh my goodness, the president lied about sleeping with a Playboy playmate, guess what? We knew that and a whole lot worse before he was elected. You, you know, it's a good point. I've talked to a lot of legal experts about this, and not a lot of them don't have very much confidence that this is a strong By the way, case. I'm not saying it's a good thing that he slept with a playmate no, no. when he was married to Melania Trump, but the American people, for whatever reason, seem to brush that kind of behavior off. John Edwards was acquitted, after all, and many legal experts think it would be unwise to bring this campaign finance case against Donald Trump. But there may be other issues here. There may be bank fraud, tax fraud, money laundering issues with the way they structured the payments. Those kinds of issues in the end could be more dangerous and damaging than the campaign finance issue. All right, Michael, how does all of this fit into your case with Stormy Daniels? Well, Stephanie, the reason uh, how it fits into our case is that there's multiple tapes, like I said previously, and in fact, um, we have sufficient uh, reason to believe that some of those tapes relate to my client you may or may not recall that months ago um, I demanded in writing to Mr. Ryan, Michael Cohen's attorney at the time, and Michael Cohen that they immediately provide us with tapes relating to my client, especially or including tapes between Keith Davidson, my client's former lawyer, um, and Michael Cohen discussing my client and the payoff. They have refused to provide that information. They've continued to refuse to provide it, which is another example of why I don't think they're doing the right thing right now. We're going to continue to press forward. We want all of the tapes released, and we especially want all of the tapes relating to my client released immediately. I'm just confused at this point, Michael. What is your current goal? What is Stormy Daniels' goal? The, the cases that you're involved in, what, what are we waiting to see happen? The truth. I get it. The truth, that certainly serves the American people. But from your perspective and getting paid for this, uh, for representing Stormy Daniels and for her, what do you want at this point? Well, again, I mean, we want the truth, Stephanie. We've always wanted the truth. We want her freed from the NDA in its entirety. We want it invalidated. We want Michael Cohen held responsible for his conduct relating to what happened to her, including the defamatory statements that he's made about her. Um, we want the president held responsible for the defamatory statement or statements that he's made about her. I mean, that's ultimately what we want. But in the interim, we, we need and deserve, and America needs and deserves the truth about what happened here. That is 100% true. It doesn't matter what your political affiliation is or your, your priorities. America certainly deserves the truth, and we deserve it from our elected officials. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.